the culvert went out. And I left Aaron, my seven-year-old kid, home because it was like our third trip downtown. Because I was worried about my grandpa my grandparents downtown. And my house is in a position where I had a, like a swamp behind it. And when the water couldn't get through the culvert fast enough, it came in over the road. And there's no culvert system in that swamp area, so when all that water came in, Russ's yeah. normal rate and the flood ended, there was nowhere for that water to go. So and my house sat in water for six weeks. So it's $130. From what we've seen so far, this is the worst disaster we've had since the 64 earthquake. So this is the worst flood. I've seen the flood victims where the houses were actually smashed, and we really didn't have that here. This was more of inundation by flood waters. But we've never had this many all at once. I saw this place just after the flood and it stayed submerged for what a good 45 to 60 days. Uh, there was a battle going on where we were pumping water out of this swamp into the next swamp but then they pumped that water from that swamp back into this swamp and it, it got a little confusing for a while but finally we got both swamps emptied and actually found the homes at the bottom of them. The idea is, is that following this flood in Galena, that we introduce housing that is much more energy efficient, more affordable to build, and durable over the long term. We're also, as, as we've talked about before, it's very important that the indoor air quality be good, that the systems, the heating system and the ventilation system be integrated so that you can't have one without the other. And a lot of the houses and villages are old. Um, they were built during a time when fuel oil was cheap, uh, labor was cheaper. A lot of them aren't real quality construction. They're certainly not energy efficient. If you average it all out, the average household in Galena might use as much as eight or 900 gallons a year of heating oil. And then electricity is really expensive as well, at 67 cents kilowatts. Generally speaking, during the flood, nine, probably 90% of the homes in Galena were impacted, and probably close to half were significantly damaged. Um, with flooding in the downstairs, where you know to the point where you had to tear out flooring and sheetrock and insulation and all that. The real advantage of this is the redundancy, that the trusses can be used for a multiple, multiple sizes of homes, from just a cabin-sized house to a bedroom. When you have an 18-inch wall cavity, it gives you a lot of options for insulation. You know, out here in rural Alaska, we have a tendency to use the urethane because it's very compact, very high R value, but it's also very expensive. So we would like to experiment with this design using cellulose, using other kinds of, of insulation. It was a, a, a race because we had two homes going up. There's this one here and we have one down the road about a half a mile and they were equal in that all their parts were on site. Uh, this one had three people, that one had 15 and this one went up quicker than that one. For here in Alaska, our building season is so short, and if you can get the house built, closed in, so that you can turn the heat on, then you can do all the stuff in the nice warmth of, during the winter months and continue working. Mm -hmm. So getting shells up is important. Getting them insulated properly is even more important. Mm -hmm. well, the really nice thing about it is it goes up so quickly, and uh, it's pretty simple and fast, and it's adaptable in terms of the size of a house you can essentially just lengthen the house and make more square feet with more trusses so you just make your foundation longer and you can build a larger house and put in more bedrooms or whatever you want to do with it. The idea was to show a home and work on a design for a home in these river and communities that are susceptible to floods. How would we build a home quickly after following a disaster? This is a template.